good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Carpton. I'm a faculty member uh, and chair for the Department of Translational Genomics at the USC Keck School of Medicine. Uh, and I would like to welcome you all to this COVID-19 vaccine town hall. Uh, we're incredibly thrilled to have you all with us this afternoon for this critically important and timely event, which is also in alignment with Black History Month. The goal of this year's event is to provide information from experts from our community about COVID-19 vaccines, and importantly, to allow community members to voice their concerns and their perspectives, uh, and to dialogue with medical experts about questions surrounding this really, really important issue. Uh, we're really excited to welcome our speakers and uh, the members of our community. And this is really about collaboration. And without our collaborators, this event would not be possible. So we'd like to thank USC Civic Engagement, Steve Wesson, uh, Coronavirus Community Response System of South Los Angeles, Charles Drew University, and the Southern California Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, as well as, of course, our community partners, organizations, churches, and faith-based institutions. The format of this meeting is such that we will first hear comments from our three speakers, and then we'll have an open panel discussion of roughly 30 minutes where the speakers will field questions uh, that will be read by our staff. We hope this provides clarity around certain issues and also spurs new thoughts and ideas on how to ensure equity uh, in our care related to COVID-19 treatment. So please use the chat function if necessary. If, if not, the staff will provide instructions on how to uh, submit questions uh, that can be read to our speakers. So without further ado, uh, let's get started with our, with our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. David Carlisle, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science in the Watts Willowbrook area of Los Angeles County, a position that he's held and served in since 2011. President Carlisle is a world renowned expert in the study and understanding of health policy, quality of care, and medical education diversity. He is truly committed to health equity and the elimination of health disparities. A board certified internal medicine specialist, President Carlisle received his bachelor's of science degree from Wesleyan University, his MD from Brown University, and his um, a master's in public health and his PhD in health services from the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. President Carlisle also served as director of the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, or OSHPD, for 11 years uh, under three California governors. Under his leadership, OSHPD released its first ever health disparities report and increased scholarship and loan repayment opportunities for health, health providers, uh, healthcare providers that committed to practice in underserved uh, and under-resourced communities. So please join me in welcoming President Carlisle. President Carlisle. Can you please unmute his microphone? Greetings, Dr. Carpenter, and thank you very much for that wonderful uh, introduction. It's, it's great to be here uh, with you all, and um, happy Black History Month. You know, in, in terms of the, um, the COVID context, uh, let me just go ahead and say that when I was up in Sacramento in state government, um, we experienced something that um, quite literally um, scared us to death. And the year was 2002, uh, the culprit was SARS. And um, we were looking at a highly fulminant, highly fatal um, airborne respiratory infectious agent that, um, that had the ability to go exponential. And um, the, the, the possibilities there were dire, facing not just the state of California, but, but every country in the world. And uh, in, our, in our agency, Health and Human Services, we knew what the stakes were. Um, we were lucky in 2003 when SARS seemed to, to burn itself out, um, perhaps inexplicably. We don't know exactly what happened with SARS, but we knew that it could, could rise again or something like it was possible. So that's why when I was um, reading the newspaper, I shouldn't say the newspaper, I was actually online, at 4.30 in the morning, uh, right after Christmas, December 27th, and I saw a story, I don't know whether it was CNN, I think it was, about an unknown pneumonia 
um, appearing in Wuhan, China, a city that frankly I, I wasn't familiar with whatsoever. I, um, my first thought was, oh no, here we go again. I hope this doesn't turn out to be as bad as SARS. Well, as we know, um, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, has totally eclipsed what SARS was in 2002, 2003, uh, to become the, the worst pandemic to hit the world in over 100 years uh, since the 1918 influenza, killing um, uh, uh, millions of people, infecting millions of people, hospitalizing millions of people. Um, and I have to say that if we did not have um, the potential of a silver bullet known as um, vaccine intervention, uh, we would be looking at a very, very dire situation right now. So I, I, I do want to commend our, our biomedical sciences community. Um, because of our concerns about SARS, about Mid Middle East respiratory syndrome, um, uh, we learned, but we did more than learn about things from a public health perspective. Um, we calibrated our vaccine technology uh, to be ready to intervene against the next coronavirus pandemic. And, and that's really why we were able to, um, to greatly um, uh, make the process of vaccine development against, um, against COVID-19 much, much quicker uh, than it would be typically because we already had the constituent components of a vaccine um, on the shelf, they were designed. And we already were ready, we, we, we were able to go through phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials uh, very rapidly because we knew what we were doing. And we were able to, of course, use the technology, new technology of an MRA vaccine um, to, uh, to bring this to, uh, to the forefront. So today, as we're looking at, at vaccination, again, it's a, a silver bullet against the, um, the COVID-19 um, uh, virus in the fight against COVID-19. Um, I liken this to a situation where you're, you're driving down the, um, the freeway, you know, you're, you're, you're going 65, well, maybe you're going 70. And, um, you know, you're, you're, you're doing everything right. You're maintaining a safe distance. You're paying attention. Um, you're ignoring your, your two-year-old in the back seat but you can still have a fatal accident. Somebody can bump into you or something like that, potentially a fatal accident. At that point, the only thing between you and the possibility of death is the fact that you put on your seatbelt. And a vaccine for patients today, for individuals today, is like putting on that seatbelt because you never know when you'll come against that imminent, clear and present danger known as the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19. That's why it's so distressing to me today that the very communities that are most likely to be afflicted with COVID-19, and especially the very communities that are most likely to disproportionately experience um, adverse outcomes and death from COVID-19, i.e. communities of color, uh, Latinx and African-American communities of color, are the least likely today in Los Angeles County and elsewhere in the country to be receiving vaccination against COVID-19. Uh, this is a policy uh, failure at this point in time. It's also a big policy challenge. We need to correct this if we're going to eradicate COVID-19. And yes, I'm sure that with proper public health measures, as well as uh, proper uh, vaccination um, uh, strategies that we're employing, uh, we can get to this point where we can talk about eradication. But we need to make sure that the vaccines are available in the very communities that are being hit the hardest by COVID-19. And right now that's not the case. Thank you so much, uh, President Carlisle, for those you know, in incredible remarks and uh, you know, the highlighting you know, some of the, the, the history of, of these viruses and, and some of the things that we've done uh, in the past, but how unique this particular virus is uh, and, uh, and, and that vaccination is important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, and there are a lot of other things that we have to do to uh, really get a handle on, on reducing the impact of this, uh, this pandemic, particularly among black and brown people. So thank you very much for those, those comments. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is a dear friend and colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Joyce Ritchie. Uh, Dr. Ritchie is an associate professor and associate dean 
for Diversity and Inclusion at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. Dr. Ritchie's research program focuses on diseases that disproportionately affect underrepresented populations and underserved communities, where her work is helping to understand the links between uh, obesity, insulin resistance, and cardiovascular diseases. She also brings significant expertise as a research mentor and role model, particularly for students that are underrepresented in science and medicine. As the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at the medical school, she leads efforts for the medical school uh, related uh, efforts related to all aspects of institutional planning in support of the diversity and inclusion goals for our medical school. These activities include meeting uh, the needs of our diverse students, our faculty, our residents and staff populations by creating a supportive and positive learning and working environment. She is also a co-leader for the USC CARE2 Health Equity Center. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ritchie. Joyce. Oh, thank you. Oh my goodness. Dr. Carpton, thank you for that incredibly warm um, introduction. It's, it's interesting. Whenever you hear introductions of yourself, you know, you're always thinking, is that, is that really me? So I would like to just say that it is truly my pleasure to participate in this just critically important, crucial community town hall. You know, as, as noted, I am a diabetes researcher and, you know, my administrative role is in the area of diversity and inclusion. So I think that um, sharing my voice in this entire experience is critically important because I am truly, truly a part of the community. Um, first of all, I also would like to say, you know, happy Black History Month, but also note that Black history is 24 hours a day, seven days a week and 365 days of the year. Um, and let me, just, let me just start by saying that um, for many years, I was extremely active in the community where I had the opportunity to, to essentially parlay and, and take my, um, my role as a biomedical researcher in diabetes and bring it to the community. Because I think that's so very important. And in that, I worked with many of the, um, the churches in LA County. Um, I was fortunate to, to even be on CNN talking about diabetes in the African-American community and, and you know, featured in, in Ebony and Essence and part of the KGLH Health Women's Forum. And I, I'm just sharing that with you to say that I have been a strong advocate on um, mitigating the devastation of type two diabetes in the community. So let me just say that it's, it's very personal and it's very real for me when we talk about um, COVID-19 because we know, um, you know, Dr. Carlisle has shared with us, we know that we are disproportionately impacted because of the various underlying um, abnormalities or diseases that we have. So, you know, COVID-19 has really unmasked you know, these tremendous health inequities. So while my area of research is not in infectious diseases, um, it's in diabetes, and we know that diabetes and obesity, that they are very high risk factors for those who have COVID-19, where the severity of the disease, the disease is much more severe, and many have succumbed to the disease itself. So this is really personal to me. I wanted to speak to you from a personal perspective. You know, even when I talk about um, type two diabetes um, and, and can, the concern of its relationship with COVID-19, you know, I look at my family dynamics and 30% of my family have type two diabetes, 90% of my family. And I'm talking about my immediate family. So this doesn't come as a surprise to any of you, I'm sure, because you can share similar stories. But when I say that 90% have hypertension, high blood pressure, you know, it's just, it, again, it just speaks to just how personal this is. Um, 
And as I mentioned, you know, Dr. Carla has walked us through this pandemic. And when I look at, again, my family, my personal experience, I'm originally from the Detroit, Michigan area. And I can say to you that I personally, I'm saying personally know of at least 30 plus individuals that have died from COVID-19. Some have been my family members, some have been, you know, close friends, and some have been associates. So it's real. This is, you know, this is devastating our, our communities. Even as early as two weeks ago, an older relative died from, from COVID-19. And as I talked to the family, what I was told was that, you know, we have been covered with the blood of Jesus. Now, I know I'm speaking to the faith-based community and, and various um, community leaders, but that is something that is very common to hear within our communities that we are protected, you know, that we are covered with the blood of Jesus and basically no harm would come to us because of this. But we have to make sure that we think about, you know, I'm a Christian and I understand this, this mindset, but we have to make sure that God also gives us what? Wisdom. And so we have to make sure that we balance and understand that factor in terms of he gives us wisdom so that we would not just put ourselves in harm's way and simply say, I don't have to worry because I am covered with the blood. And I think that um, there was an article in the LA Times earlier this week that even spoke to that where unfortunately um, one of our Latinx um, brothers died from the disease because he exposed himself saying that he was going to be protected. He was covered with the blood. You know, I just personally completed two doses, my two doses of the vaccination. And each time, what did I do? I personally sent a, a video to my entire family because it all starts at home, right? So I sent a video clip of my experience to the entire family because again, it's personal. I wanted them to witness, to personally witness that I felt that this vaccine is safe. And I would think that knowing um, what I do, that they would say, and, and them trusting me in doing so, that they would say, oh, if she's doing it, it's okay. I'm going to do it as well. So, you know, we all talk about well, I'm concerned when I say we, I'm talking about our community. I'm concerned about this vaccine because of the horrific experimentation that has been done over the years with our black and brown, our vulnerable populations. And, you know, something that's always discussed is the Tuskegee syphilis study. And this is where, of course, black males who, who had syphilis were observed, they were studied. And when a treatment plan was discovered, they were not informed. So they could not take advantage of that treatment plan. They were not infected with syphilis, no. They were allowed to essentially suffer from the disease, although there was a therapeutic available. So Let's put this in perspective. Now, in today's context, we are suffering from COVID-19 at a, just an alarming rate. And here we have an opportunity where we have the treatment. We know that the treatment is available in terms of vaccines and being vaccinated. 
but we are refusing for whatever reason there may be, we are refusing to take advantage of that treatment. So we are the ones that are suffering at this disproportionate alarming rate, although a vaccine is currently available. And so we're not being denied, we, think about it. We're denying ourselves if you feel that you do not want to take the vaccine. So I would like to encourage each of you, um, if you're wavering on what should I do, you know, there are a couple of things to consider. One, you know, as Dr. Carlisle mentioned, this process wasn't rushed. I know some people are thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, it just overnight they came up with a vaccine. No, that is not the case. You know, this has been work that has been conducted as early as 2013. And we're now in what, 2021. So it's not a rush process. No, no steps were, um, there were no missteps in creating the vaccine as well. So, you know, please just don't deny yourself access. And then um, I also like to mention that, you know, um, some people have said, well, I'm afraid that um, this is some, you know, experiment tracking device that's being placed in us from the Gates Foundation. Again, totally, you know, let's, let's, dispel that myth, totally, totally untrue. Hey, Joy, um, I, I think some of these, uh, that's, that's great. We wanna make sure that we have enough time for the discussion part. Um, and I, I can't, uh, and I wanna make sure that we get Dr. Dang in and that we have at least 30 minutes. Okay. You know, Cause I really wanna hear from the community. I mean, for me, that, that, that's the meat. And my, my bet is everything you've got written down there is gonna come up in the discussion. I can almost guarantee it. Um, and you hit on some of the just, you know, critically important aspects of, you know, leading by example, by you saying, I've just got, I just received my second shot. I mean, how important that is to say, I'm here, I'm a leader, and I'm, I'm, I'm out here, right? And, and so, you know, leading by example, and then the perspective around the, the mistrust of the, of the community, that article from the New York Times is powerful, uh, and uh, how we hear stories from patients uh, and this whole concept of the mistrust of biomedical research and uh, medical research and how that can prevent right, us participating and being involved in healthcare innovation. And so thank you so much for your comments, but I guarantee you many of the, the additional comments you were gonna make are gonna come up in the, in the Q&A. And that was it. That, those were the, the points I wanted to address. So thank you Perfect. so much. <laughs> Thanks, Joyce. So, so I wanna move on uh, to our next speaker. That was Dr. Uh, Richard Dang. Uh, Dr. Dang is an assistant professor of clinical pharmacy and program director for the PGY-1 community-based pharmacy res residency program uh, at the USC School of Pharmacy. And he's also the president-elect for the California Pharmacists Association. Con congratulations, Dr. Dang. Uh, Dr. Dang's expertise is in immunization, travel health, and community health programs. And these have led to his role as a leading advocate and thought resource uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. He also served as chair for the California Pharmacists Association COVID-19 Task Force and is a member of the USC COVID-19 Vaccine Planning Steering Committee. Also, he is, uh, participates on the California State Testing Task Force, the CDPH Immunization Branch Pharmacy Task Force, uh, and the Adult Working Group for the Immunization Action Coalition of Los Angeles. Dr. Deng is also a medical consultant to international travel health uh, platforms, uh, as well as COVID-19 testing and vaccine uh, de uh, development uh, programs. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Deng. Dr. Deng. Thank you, Dr. Carpin. Such a pleasure and privilege to be here with everyone this evening. Um, so for my portion of the introduction, I just wanna review some of the um, foundational information about the vaccine and build upon what Dr. Carlisle and Dr. Ritchie had mentioned as well, very important topics and very much looking forward to having a conversation, answering some questions that our community members might have. 
And Nikki, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I think this, there you go. Um, so for this portion, I think this slide here really summarizes what Dr. Kalas uh, was talking about when we think about the vaccine development process and what Dr. Rishi mentioned as well. The vaccine development process, um, you might have heard that it, some people said that it was rushed or they're concerned about the speed of which things progressed. Um, and as the vaccine was being developed, I asked the same questions as well. And so taking a look at the information and really uh, learning more about the process, I learned that no steps were skipped during the vaccine development process. Every single step that you would normally expect with a traditional vaccine uh, was completed uh, with this particular vaccine product. Uh, additionally, like Dr. Kyle said, we did build upon previous knowledge and technologies from the SARS virus and the MERS virus. Um, so I think the, the point is every single step was taken. There were clinical trials that were conducted. And in fact, there were very large clinical trials that were conducted with the current COVID-19 vaccines that we're utilizing. With one product, Moderna alone, we had 30,000 people participate in that clinical trial. With the other vaccine product, Pfizer, there were 40,000 people who participated in the clinical trial. Um, and so just between those two products, we had close to 100,000 people participate in the studies. And that is magnitudes larger than the number of people who normally participate in a vaccine trial for other vaccines. Just to compare for a vaccine like shingles, there are only about 10 to 20,000 people who participated in that trial. And so we have a lot of individuals where this product was studied in. And additionally, they did also made a huge effort to include participants of a variety of different race and ethnicities from a variety of different countries, as well as different occupational exposures all the way from medical professionals to frontline workers who work in a variety of different sectors. Uh, so there are diverse populations included uh, in the clinical trials where we saw some of the data that was included. Next slide, please. And so these are some of the candidates that you might be hearing about. And uh, as you may know, the two products that we are currently utilizing here in the United States is the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Pretty soon, we might have other vaccines that are going to be authorized based on their data if it, sh if it is proven to be safe and effective. Some of those products might include the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Novavax vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And the more products we can have that have been shown to be uh, safe and effective, the more quickly we can uh, roll out vaccines to all of our uh, populations. Next slide, please. So just touching base on the uh, surface level of the, some of the safety information of the vaccine, um, as I mentioned, they did do fairly large clinical trials on the vaccine product in order for the FDA and the CDC, as well as the state of California to approve and authorize the vaccine to be used. Um, and based on the, that trial and that data, they shown that it's quite effective. Actually, it's about 94.5 to 95% effective in preventing uh, symptomatic COVID-19 disease. And as far as the side effects that you can typically expect, when we look at some of the things listed here on the slide, things like pain at the injection site, swelling, redness, fatigue, headache, chills, nausea, vomiting, and maybe fever, these are all reactions that we would typically expect from any other vaccination, including things like the flu shot, the tetanus vaccine, and the shingles vaccine. And in fact, they didn't find any severe or significant side effects as a part of the clinical trial that they conducted. Um, so from my perspective, it is quite comparable and very safe in terms of the data that was shown from the, the trials that were conducted. And these are also the very same side effects that you would expect if your body is reacting to a disease. These are the symptoms that say, hey, my immune system is working. My body is learning to react to the virus. It's learning to fight against the virus. So these are actually the symptoms that we would hope that we would see from a very effective product. Next slide, please. Um, and so with that, I just want to emphasize how many people have already received the vaccine and maybe just answer some, or provide some information as far as how you can access the vaccine when it comes to be your turn um, in the process. So first of all, in the United States to date, we have administered vaccines to over 44.5 million Americans. And in California, that includes 5 million individuals. And in Los Angeles County, 1 million individuals. And specifically in the city of Los Angeles, through our efforts with USC, 
the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Fire Department, we've provided uh, vaccines to close to 300,000 individuals uh, since the products have come to market over the last month. Um, and so with that having said that, when the CDC looked at the data, it's been shown again to be very effective, very, very uh, low cases of potential allergic reactions that have been reported or other significant issues. Lots of data about that that we could spend hours talking about, but 44.5 million doses administered and very small number of uh, significant issues, mostly having to do with allergic reactions were reported. Now, as far as how you can access the vaccine, you may have heard a lot of confusing, contradictory information about who is eligible and when are people eligible. And that I do agree that that has been the case. But where we stand right now, what we do know today is that in Los Angeles County, individuals who are either healthcare workers or residents of nursing homes can get the vaccine as a part of the phase 1A group. And individuals who are 65 and older, and so are older adults, can also get the vaccine included in the phase 1B group. For anyone else who wasn't mentioned, uh, they will be allocated in later phases. And the reason we have to spread it out like this in separate phases is because there's simply not enough vaccines to go around. The drug companies are trying to produce it as quickly as possible, but there's simply just not enough for everyone who needs it right now. And everyone needs and deserves the vaccine, absolutely. Some of the next groups that are being planned to be able to have access to the vaccines include teachers, uh, frontline uh, workers in food and agriculture, including farm workers, grocery store workers, as well as essential emergency uh, workers like our first responders and police officers. After that group, the state of California will then be shifting to an age-based group release. So meaning they'll go to, um, you know, the after the 65 plus, they'll maybe go to 50 plus, 40 plus, 30 plus, as the supplies allow us to move on down to expand to more populations. So if you are belonging to an eligible group, I would highly encourage you to get the vaccine as soon as you can. And the best resource for that would be to go to the uh, LA County's website at vaccinatelacounty.com. And I'll put the information in the chat box so that you can have access to that as well. And that website will include all the information about how to make an appointment and where to go. And for those who don't have access to a computer or have difficulty using a computer or internet, there's also a phone number that you can call as well. And I'll also provide that in the chat box. Next slide. In addition to getting your vaccines at uh, the LA County website, I also wanna uh, highlight that vaccines will are now available at a variety of places. You can get it at hospitals, like the Keck Medical Center of USC. You can get it at your pharmacy, like USC pharmacies. You can get it at your doctor's office. You can get it at a LA County site. You can get it at a LA City site. And you can also get it at State of California sites. And all those information is available online. But I do want to highlight some of the locations that might you might be, be interested in being aware of. LA City is running uh, five locations out of the 200 locations in LA County. So LA City is providing vaccinations at Crenshaw Christian Center, uh, Hanson Dam, San Fernando Valley Park, Lincoln Park in East LA Boyle Heights area, um, and Dodger Stadium. In addition to those sites, this week LA City has launched its mobile vaccination clinics where there's going to be a van who will be going around the various communities of Los Angeles providing access to those communities that may not be able to access drive through locations. And this week they began at the Baldwin Hills Mall um, and they will be rotating on a, a, a they will be rotating areas on a regular basis to provide access to those communities. Um, and the mobile vaccinations, you'll be able to walk up with those without appointments because it's really meant for members of those communities. And so I would encourage you to connect with your local council district to find out more about when that mobile vaccine will be coming to your local area. And I, I want to close out by saying that USC has been very much involved in these vaccine efforts. We're running the vaccine vaccination program at Lincoln Park with the city of Los Angeles, as well as Dodger Stadium. And we're also in talks of opening up further vaccine clinics around the Expo Park area on campus at the USC University Park area, um, as well as um, talking to see about working, uh, looking at Pierce College as a location. So we're very, we're very much aware that we need to ramp up as many vaccination sites as possible, especially in communities that really need it and that are 
so affected by COVID-19 vaccine. So that's definitely something that we're looking to roll out very, very soon. Um, and so with that, on this slide here, you'll see some other further um, information about where to get the vaccination. But bottom line is the LA County website, and then I really like this website on here called vaccinateca.com. It's a really comprehensive database of all vaccine providers in your local area. And I'll put all that information into the chat box. So with that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Carpton so that we can open it up for discussion. Uh, thank you so much for those, those, those comments and all of that rich information and, and on resources that can be um, uh, accessed, right, for, for additional information and uh, also access to vaccinations. Uh, just tremendous. I wanna thank all of our uh, speakers for those um, insightful comments. And to me, this is where all the fun begins in the Q&A. Um, you know, we've got about 25 minutes and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here, right? I'm not going anywhere. I hope, I don't know if any of our speakers have hard stops, but uh, there are a lot of questions and I think they're all critically important. So I'm here as long as I can, uh, until, until we get through as much of this as possible. Meg, I don't know what you wanna do. I don't know if you guys are gonna close, turn the lights off on us or, or not, but um, so, so uh, you know, the staff broke this down beautifully into various categories such as trust, safety, vaccine distribution, side effects, uh, and uh, post-vaccine uh, issues. And so I'll walk through the questions and I may ask one of the speakers to focus on a question, but if any of the other speakers want to uh, uh, provide insights, that's great. So why don't we start with trust? Um, and I'll have Joyce respond here. Uh, so one of the questions is, you know, how widespread is vaccine hesitancy in the black community? Uh, and what are some of the reasons for it? So um, as I touched upon briefly, it's, it's very, you know, <laughs> it's widespread for sure. Um, many feel that this is, you know, some type of experiment. Many feel that it was done too quickly. And it's just, it's interesting because just like, as I mentioned, you know, when we think about the sickle cell, I mean, I'm sorry, the um, Tuskegee story, it's like here we have the opportunity to receive the vaccine, but we're denying ourselves because of that history, you know, where we just don't trust it. We think that something's up, so to speak. So it, it is widespread, but that is the purpose of these types of town halls. You know, we really want to dispel those, um, those ideas because it, it's simply, if we're doing it, that's why it's so important. I'm sure that everyone on this panel, you know, they're going to get vaccinated or they have been vaccinated. So we're, we're not asking or saying do something that we're not doing ourselves. And I think that's what's what's so important to, to keep in mind. That's a, a great, great comments, uh, Joyce. And, you know, I agree, you know, th there are a lot of factors that influence uh, the hesitancy. Uh, I think misinformation is one of them and we have to come to grips with that. Um, I remember many of the celebrities on social media saying, where are our black doctors at, right? Where are they to provide us the information so that we're getting the information from, you know, trusted individuals where here, well, here we are. Um, and uh, I think we, we're, we're, we're making the point loud and clear um, that in this particular setting, uh, that this healthcare innovation, this vaccine is critically important for us getting our hands around this pandemic. Um, and, and, and we have to be involved in this. We have to ask questions. We have to have the information and we have every right to speak, speak on it and provide our perspective. But without this vaccination, um, we'll never be able to get our hands around this, 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 this pandemic. So the next question um, will go to safety. John, I just want to briefly add, please, please share what you've learned during this town hall with others. Because that's, we want to spread the information, you know, just don't hold it on, hold it to yourself, share it with others, because that's just so critically important. So Absolutely. So if you want to tweet or... TikTok or you know uh, Instagram, you know whatever it is that we're holding this this town hall, please do so, and uh, we want to continue to engage with the community uh, around providing you know information on these important issues. 
So let's go to safety. Um, and if I'd uh, love to have here Do uh, uh, President Carlisle's um, uh, response here. Uh, how would you advise a high-risk person 65 plus about accepting the vaccine when they have a history of sensitivity or cannot tolerate proven flu vaccines, most commonly prescribed medications used for diabetes, cholesterol, and the like? Uh, is there any proof that the benefits actually outweigh the risk uh, to such a person taking uh, uh, any of these vaccines? That is a tremendous question. Well, I, I um, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carpton. That's a really, really great question. Um, you, you know, the, the, the bottom line answer is for, for individuals, if you have questions about this, especially if you, if you find yourself in a, a high risk group, um, uh, go to your own provider, go to your doctor, ask them specifically, given what you know about me as a patient, should I receive the vaccine? Uh, the overwhelming answers are going to be yes. There are only a few circumstances under which uh, one should, should not receive the vaccine, including um, perhaps a history of an uh, anaphylactic reaction. But even then, that is not a necessarily a uh, absolute contraindication because the vaccine sites, the centers are standing by with um, uh, interventions available if uh, under the rare circumstances somebody should have a anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine. That is a very, very rare outcome. Um, uh, we've given millions and millions of doses. Um, it's happened only very, very infrequently. But yes, if you have questions like that, ask your doctor. Um, even with those risk factors, the answer is uh, uniformly or almost uniformly, yes, because again, COVID-19 is a killer. It is a clear and present danger. And um, I don't know anyone that I would encourage to play Russian roulette uh, with their life, not just their life, but uh, with COVID-19, we have to worry about the lives of everyone else that we come in contact, our households, our family members, our parents, our, our, our grandparents. Um, the last thing you wanna do is infect somebody else with COVID-19 and have them have a, a, a fatal outcome from this condition. Thank you so much for that, that perspective. Uh, President Carlisle, and I, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. You have to engage with your primary care physician, you know, make sure you have all the information. Um, and I think, you know, over time, as we learn more about the, the side effects and the toxicity profiles of the various vaccines, right, they'll be able to point you in the right direction. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next one we'll go to is vaccine distribution. Dr. Dang, uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. And it's a short question, but I think a really interesting one. Should pregnant women take the vaccine? That's a really great question. So um, there's limited data on the use in pregnant women regarding the vaccine. However, we do know that getting COVID is very dangerous to a pregnant mother and to the potential newborn. And so weighing that fact, um, it does say that the benefits of getting the vaccine would be greater than the risks. Um, scientifically, there is no concern for a pregnant woman based on what we know about the way that the vaccine works. Uh, we don't expect it to be able to cross the placenta and to harm the fetus um, because the vaccine degrades very quickly is the short answer. Um, so yes, I would recommend that a pregnant woman consider getting the vaccine in order to protect her because uh, it'd be more dangerous if she were to get COVID while pregnant. Very good. I, that, that's, I, I think, right, you, you hit two things, right? We still need more data right on the the potential risks um but currently the current you know thought is that the the benefit would outweigh the risk uh in in that particular setting so thank you so much uh, i i'd like to you sort of follow up on on that to some degree which is uh, you know also under the distribution which is uh when will kids be able to get vaccine and are we getting our kids vaccinated <laughs> That's a really great question. So the studies that have been uh, completely that have been completed so far um, only included data for children who were 16 or 18 years and older. So as of right now, Pfizer is only approved for 16 years and older and Moderna for 18 years and older. There are ongoing studies right now that include the um, adolescent populations. So as those studies conclude and end and as their data gets uh, analyzed, if it is shown to be safe and effective, that lower age group will continue to be uh, brought down uh, by the CDC. But at this point in time, it's only been approved and demonstrated to be safe 
for those who are 16 or 18 years in order, depending on which product we're talking about. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Dr. Dang. The next question, I'll go back up to trust. Um, and I think this is a really interesting question um, because it, yeah. So it says, when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is released, can it be trusted? Recently, Johnson & Johnson were sued for baby powder causing ovarian cancer. And I'm not certain I can trust this company. Um, and then the second question is, uh, and, and I guess sort of linked to that is, when that vaccine is available, will USC and other institutions be, be given that vaccine, given that it was developed by, by that company? Joyce? You want to tackle that one? <laughs> um, that may just be above our pay grade. <laughs> whether or not USC would actually give that vaccine. Right now, I know that USC, we're using the, the Pfizer um, um, vaccine. But I, I think that when we think about trust, I'm sure the, the, the Johnson & Johnson in terms of the efficacy, in terms of being how effective it is at um, whether preventing or reducing the severity of COVID-19 is not shown to be quite as effective as Pfizer or Moderna, but it's still, you know, quite effective. And it's, it's one, you know, a lot of people just think, oh, I only have to get one, you know, um, one shot, so to speak, in my arm. But I, that that's a, a loaded question, as you can imagine. And I can't, I definitely don't want to speak on behalf of um, the Keck Medical Center in terms of what we will use. I am going to gracefully refer this to Dr. Carlisle at Drew Medical Center and get his input to see where they stand on this. <laughs> yes, okay, well, uh, well, thank you, Dr. Ritchie. And um, uh, we, um, uh, our university isn't uh, directly involved in patient care at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. So, uh, so in terms of uh, direct patient care, this is not a decision that we have to make, but we certainly are uh, implementing steps to, um, to vaccinate our students, faculty, and staff. And um, uh, I, you know, quite frankly, the bottom line is, as you said, any vaccine is miles better than not getting vaccinated in the face of COVID-19. You know, in terms of trust, I, I, I heard a, a very good story um, and um, came across a term that was coined by a health professional, an African-American health professional this weekend. And we tend to think that they're, you know, they're vaccine takers and vaccine deniers, um, uh, but there's, a, there's a, an important group in the middle. And, and she, she coined this term, slow vaxxers. And these are individuals who are just waiting um, uh, they, they, they're not rapid adopters. Um, uh, they're, they're kind of sitting back and seeing what happens. But most of those individuals, I am sure, are eventually going to be receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think that's a very, very good thing. It reminds me of when I used to drive up and down uh, Crenshaw Boulevard early on in the pandemic. Not a lot of people were wearing face masks. But now when I drive up and down Crenshaw, just about everybody's got a, a face mask on, and that is gratifying. It took a while. I'm sure that we'll get to that point with vaccination as well, despite the fact that, that right now there are issues with um, hesitancy, trust, et cetera. That's great. Uh, the next question I think is an interesting one, um, and I I'd like Joyce to answer this, uh, given her own experience, um, and that is, how likely is the effect from the vaccine uh, worse than the effects of the virus itself? Now, I know you haven't had the virus, but you have had the vaccine. If you can share your own experience, right, with the side effects that you, you experienced. So I, I will share with you that my, um, the, the first um, shot, I, I felt nothing. Okay, and as I said, I, I'm a scientist, so I a little OCD in there somewhere and I'm thinking, well, I should feel something because I need to know that it's working, that there's an immune, immune response to this. But seriously, the first, um, the first dose, I felt nothing. But then the second dose, 
I felt, and, 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 and John, Dr. Carver will tell you because we worked on a lot of committees together. I was so out of it a couple of times that I couldn't even meet, but it was just, it was, you know, it's like flu-like symptoms, you know, the achiness, um, headaches, those types of things. But I share it with you, the deaths from COVID-19. So I'll take it any day of the week because it was transient. It was only for, you know, a few days. And right now I'm fine. I'm, I'm almost a, a week out or so from that second dose. And, and most people have said that the second dose um, seems to, to, you know, you have those side effects more so from the second dose. So I think that, um, you know, I'll do it over and over and over again. And I have um, a 92 year old mom that I'm, you must get vaccinated, um, you know, other relatives. So this is, um, you know, as I said, it's personal. And it's not something that I'm taking lightly by any stretch because I know what it looks like by not being vaccinated and what can come of, you know, what happens in those instances. So right. uh, I think that it wasn't something that you're just so um, debilitated or you can't function, you know, you're gonna feel down, but just like some of you, if you've taken the blue, vac blue vaccine, where I'm sure afterwards, a little slight fever, a little achiness and those types of things, but it, you know, you'll get through it, but yeah. far worth it and we'll do yeah. it again. Yeah, I think like many, many vaccines and many treatments, it will definitely have different, uh, a different impact on different individuals, uh, given their own sort of conditions and, 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 and health, health setting. Um, and, uh, but it, it definitely there's likely to be a significant difference between the side effects from the vaccine versus getting COVID-19. Uh, again, especially given your own uh, physiology. So, so and, and I wanted to also state that um, Placidia Williams mentioned that they're holding, they've held a number of town halls to educate the community uh, 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 on, on COVID-19 vaccines. And so I want to put in that plug that, you know, this is just one of a number of these types of events, right? And again, if, you know, if there was ever a scenario of it takes a village, this is it. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, a system right in the community that you can reach out to that is doing everything possible to get our get their hands around this uh, this uh, pandemic uh, within within our community. Uh, so so reach out to the folks at Drew, um, uh, Dr. Dang. I think it'd be great to uh, answer this question. Um, the person says they've been to the Vaccinate LA website many times and have not been able to find any local uh, places to get vaccinated. They said they go there, uh, several, there are several steps. Uh, they tell you there's no point appointments available and they've spent two hours on the phone with no one answering the phone. So, you know, you can get frustrated with these things, but, you know, give us some context on what are the best, right? What are the best resources to really get some information uh, in terms of getting vac vaccinated? I hear you. It is a frustrating process all around. Um, I think, again, going back to the, it's, there's such limited supply. There's millions of people trying to go onto one website, trying to access a finite number of appointments. Um, and we, we need to do better and we can do better um, as the supply increases. What I can say is I would recommend checking as often as you can. What I've seen so far is that appointments tend to open uh, on a weekly basis. So typically a weekend, Saturday or Sunday might be the best time to check for openings. And then typically, sometimes they open more appointments the night before. Um, and so I, I know we don't want to spend our time refreshing our browsers, but I think checking occasionally, making a habit of checking once a week or every few days to see when appointments are open uh, would probably be one thing I would suggest. And also just looking to see where else vaccines are now being offered. Um, the LA County website 
really directs you primarily towards the county and city run sites. But as I mentioned, there's also pharmacies and doctor's offices, uh, hospitals that are offering vaccines as well. So I would try to see if you can make some calls there to see what their process is like. And it's, it's a very fragmented process, I will be honest. And what we're being told by the state is soon they're gonna centralize all of that information. Um, so we're gonna look forward to that um, towards the end of the month to see what that process would look like, um, to see how we can have that information. But in the meantime, that's why I included the vaccinateca.com website, because that's actually a crowdsource website that a bunch of people came together. Not, you know, they don't work for any government agencies. They were the ones making calls to pharmacies and hospitals and doctor's offices, and they put all that information onto one website into a searchable database. So if you're having difficulty with the county website, I would recommend checking out maybe vaccinateca.com and seeing what local uh, providers are offering the vaccine at that time. Yeah, thank, thanks for that information. So if you don't mind, I like to just jump in here because in down in the, um, South LA in the Watts area, the Kedrin Clinic, I've, I've read about them. They have been um, just very active and engaged in the community and making sure that our, you know, our black and brown um, residents are vaccinated. So I, that's something to consider as well. And it's, you know, I don't have all of the information, but it's the Kedrin Clinic, K-E-D-R-E-N. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ritchie, thank you very much for that information. Kedron is a clinical affiliate of Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science, and that site um, garnered about 15 minutes of attention on the Rachel Maddow show just a few days ago. Um, one of our family medicine uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Jerry Abraham, uh, was the featured uh, interviewee, and Kedron is right there in the community doing what needs to be done, and I certainly commend them. Fantastic. Fantastic. I Wow, that, that's such rich information. That's, that's this is this is incredible. Um, so so next next series of questions. Um, I think there's some someone would like to have a little bit of clarity. I think it was uh, mentioned that you know the vaccines weren't rushed and you know there were you know um, uh, robust clinical trials, but yet and still it was an emergency FDA approval. Who wants to sort of describe the difference between rushing a clinical trial versus getting emergency uh, uh, approval. I think I can like a perfect question for Dr. Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the difference between an emergency use authorization and a full approval would be typically for a full approval, you have to complete all of the studies uh, before it's done. And by all the studies, one of the perfect examples earlier when we talked about age, how I said, you know, they didn't finish the trial or the test in young children yet. They've only included 16 and up and ongoing, they're having the, the trial in teams, right? So to get a full approval, they would have had to wait for all of the arms of the study to complete before they submit their application. And if, if we did that, it would take a long time, right? What we're doing now is we're authorizing it based on the limited information, the limited arms that have completed um, as soon as they're available. And the other things with the emergency use authorization is typically approval cycles fall under pre set meeting dates. So for example, the CDC actually only meets three times a year to talk about vaccines. And during the emergency use approval, they actually have to set emergency meetings a few weeks after they receive an application. And so you see it's reducing some of that bureaucratic red tape where normally you would have to wait until the next meeting, which might take place in a few months, or if that agenda is full, then maybe next year. But in this case, they're really focusing on this specific application, this specific project only. And so they're holding early meetings so that they can discuss and evaluate that data. Right, so, so it's not that, uh, it's, it's very, I think it's very different from saying, we didn't generate all the data that was needed to get the approval um, uh, versus saying, let's go ahead and approve with the understanding that there's additional data that will be collected over time. Right. Um, and, and so it's great. So one of the things I do want to do, and I know we're, we're getting close to the hour. Again, I'm, I'm willing to hang on, you know, because this is so critically important. Um, but I, what, I, what I want to do is take a step back, right, and not take for granted that everyone knows what a vaccine is. Uh, and how they work. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, I could speak to that, but uh, Dr. Carlisle, it, would you be willing to provide sort of a, 
a, a layman's version? Of, you know, what is a vaccine and how do they actually work? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. You know, um, this is not my my area of uh, scientific expertise. Uh, you know, we have uh, viral immunologists and uh, and others around um, who can can certainly speak to this specifically. Shot. But it's, it's 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 really it's really not that 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 um, that complex. Um, basically, what a vi vaccine is doing is um, is having your body plan for or and prepare for when it might be faced with something dangerous, um, a virus, a bacteria that can be dangerous. But ordinarily, your body would mount an immune response, but it may not be enough to fight off the infection. The vaccine allows you to develop that immune response earlier and more effectively. And it can focus on a specific agent like the novel coronavirus. Um, we're taking your body's natural defenses and amplifying them uh, to make them more effective. That's really all a vaccine is. And I can get into lots of scientific detail, but again, just remember that analogy. That vaccine is that seatbelt you put on that might save your life. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, so yeah, Dr. Dang. I was just gonna add on, um, it, it really helps teach your body how to recognize the virus so that when you run into it again, it knows exactly how to fight it and what it looks like. So the simplest terms of how I usually describe it, it's, it's basically like the vaccine is posting wanted signs of the virus in your body. And so the next time you see it, all your cells, your immune system knows exactly what it looks like. And they say, hey, this is an intruder that we saw last time. Let's get rid of it. That's it. That's it. And so essentially, um, this virus, right, a vi these viruses, imagine a softball, right, where you have the skin on the outside of the softball and you have the string on the inside, right? And so you've seen the pictures of the, the circle with the little sort of RNA, the little strand inside of it. And so what they do is they take just a little piece of one of those proteins, right? And they uh, uh, use that as a way for your body to recognize when the actual virus comes inside of you, right? Or, or when you're infected by the actual virus. And so it, it's in, in olden days, they would just kill the virus, heat it up and kill it and inject it to get the antibodies. But now there are much more sophisticated ways for them to do that. So they take a little bit, a little small piece of something that looks like the virus and injects that. And then they find an antibody to that. And now you're, it allows your body to recognize if the actual full virus uh, uh, infects your body, right? And then your immune system will will uh, uh, come into play to attack the virus and kill it. So it does prevent you from getting the virus um, or, or being impacted by the virus. And this goes to one of the, the additional questions, which is if you already have the vaccine or if you're going, going in to get vaccinated and you, and you have the virus, but you're asymptomatic, right? What does that mean for you? And what does that mean for the people you might be around after you're vaccinated? Who wants to take that question? Dr. Dang? So, so what do we know about if you if you either get infected, right, and then go and get a, and get vaccinated, but not know that you're 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 COVID positive? Uh, and what happens if you get vaccinated and then you get COVID? Yeah, so for the first part, if you've had COVID, can you get vaccinated? The short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is, well, since you've had the disease before and you've recovered, you should have a period of time where you have natural immunity, where your body can still recognize and fight against the virus. And that right now is estimated at about three months. And so the recommendation is that if you can wait that three months, because we just don't have enough supply for everyone, if you can save that dose for someone else who needs it, that's what they would recommend. However, you can still get it. There is no safety concern as far as getting the vaccine after uh, you've already had the disease. On the other way around, you can get the vaccine and still get the, you, sorry, you can still get the vaccine and still get infected with the disease because remember, nothing is 100% effective. Um, and so there's still that possibility. And it also takes a few weeks for the vaccine to become fully effective. Now, keep in mind too that Pfizer and Moderna, you also have to take two doses. So you have to finish both doses, wait a few weeks after that, and then you have that quote unquote full protection, but even then it's not 100% still. So there is a chance that you can get infected, 
Um, and if you are infected, you do have that possibility of spreading the disease, um, even though you've been vaccinated. Right. Uh, uh, perfect answer. Um, I think there's another r really provocative question uh, here, which is, you know, what do we what do we say to the naysayers, right, who say that their constitutional rights are being violated um, and it's their freedom of choice? Um, and if they're forced to get a vaccination, then what's next? I don't know who wants to, who wants to take that question. Dr. Carlisle, I'd love to hear your, hear your perspective on that. Well, this, this is, a, this is a, a really good question because uh, there is, a, I, I think, a, a, a portion of the population uh, that is, is really resistant to, to receiving vaccination. Um, and I, I think the, the best solution, basically, is to, uh, to speak to them directly and uh, to present um, uh, the evidence that we have, the information we have, and, um, and, and uh, make an effort to, um, to share that with them. Um, but people still have the, um, uh, the, the, the right to, to turn down medical treatment. Um, that is, is still a fundamental right. Um, and the, the point is that we, we really want to focus on the people in the middle uh, where we can shift that center of gravity effectively. Uh, we may not be able to convince everyone to receive the vaccine, and, and people, people have very valid um, reasons sometimes to, to, to say no to vaccination. Uh, when I have a, a patient who's, who's not inclined, um, it's important for me to, to basically say, um, you know, I hear you. Um, I, I recognize the points that you're making um, and I, I, I appreciate your viewpoint. Um, but, but here's my viewpoint as a physician. And here's what I, I share with, with patients. Um, I have patients all the time who are making um, significant decisions about medical interventions. They're reluctant sometimes to undergo um, uh, a surgery or to receive a certain critical medication. It's my job as a physician to basically present the evidence to them and, and, and make, try, try to, to the fullest extent of my ability um, to share with them why I'm making the argument that I am, that they, that they receive a, a medication or undergo a, a procedure. And more often than not, uh, that reluctant patient is gonna say, um, doctor, thank you very much. The thing that I worry about the most is the, the individual who comes to me later and says, doctor, I should have listened to you. Because when I encounter that, it's telling me that I was probably not as effective as I could have been. And I need to you know, improve my effectiveness. That's, that's the worst thing I can hear as a doctor. Doctor, I should have listened to you. I made a mistake. Thank, thank you so much for that, that, that perspective. Um, I, there are a series of questions about side effects and pre-existing conditions. I know we touched on that and you know, without a doubt, if you, know, if you suffer from a, a se severe pre-existing uh, pre condition, you should consult your primary care physician before you even consider the vaccination and make sure that you have that meeting and that discussion because they, they will be much more uh, intimately uh, um, uh, uh, you, they'll have a much much more intimate knowledge of your current status and your condition, and whether or not you're you're you know a good candidate uh, for for the the vaccine or if you should uh, uh, wait. Um, there there were a couple of questions. One is um, is there any any information about you know, the effect of the vaccine on people who who might suffer from sickle cell disease? which of course disproportionately affects underrepresented minority individuals. So any, any thoughts, Dr. Dang, on pre-existing pre conditions such as, such as this and whether or not you should be vaccinated or not? I think to see if that population was included in the clinical trials. Um, I know a variety were, um, but I'm not recalling if sickle cell was on there. But what I can say in general is that having sickle cell disease may um, cause you to have lower immune uh, system, which may expose you to higher risk of infections. And so I would say that the risk of getting COVID is actually much more dangerous for someone with sickle cell disease. And just based on that, and based on um, the fact that there were some immunocompromised patients included in the clinical trials, and it was still shown to be safe, I would still recommend it for individuals with that particular condition. And I would just underscore exactly what Dr. Dang just said. Um, uh, sickle cell patients are uh, immune compromised in a way that would mean that they 
are in a group that absolutely should be vaccinated against COVID-19, absolutely. There are very few patients uh, for whom the, vac the vaccines are not uh, recommended. And those tend to be patients who have um, autoimmune disorders who are actively on immunosuppressant medications. Um, but virtually every other pre-existing condition is actually more of an indication to receive the vaccination than not, especially the common conditions, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease. Um, those individuals that constitute you know, 90 percent of people with uh, existing conditions are exactly the conditions that we need to um, uh, prevent the COVID-19 virus from uh, affecting individuals with them. Just, just amazing. And I think what we'll do is we'll take a few more. And I know we're we're past the hour again. This is just such an important um, meeting. I think we still have a full room. Everyone is like just eating this up. I know I am. Uh, I think there's a, another interesting question. May not be uh, rel relative specifically to the vaccination, but to sort of COVID-19 impact on communities of color. And uh, one of the question is, do we believe that this increase, the, the disparity that we see in COVID is uh, associated more with population density, uh, comorbidities, or uh, poor access to care? Uh, Dr. Uh, President Carlisle, you're, you're leading uh, what is essentially a safety net hospital in the community. Uh, and, and I would love to hear your perspective on that. Well, um, yes, and thank you. I, I do want to give a shout out to my, my friends and colleagues at the uh, MLK Community Hospital, um, CEO, Dr. Lane Batchelor. Um, you know, they're in the trenches. They're on the front lines. Um, they're fighting the fight 24 seven. Um, and um, they were just featured in the, uh, the New York Times. There was an Art Guardian uh, article about them. Um, you know, 24 seven doing twice as much work as, it, as they, they should be because the demand is so great. You know, um, when you think about the African-American community, every risk factor that would predispose a community to have more cases is working against the African-American community and the Latinx community as well. Um, whether it is uh, comorbid conditions, whether it is um, living in high density, multi-generational houses, whether it is working in, in uh, essential jobs, uh, bus drivers, um, uh, fast food restaurant employees, et cetera, et cetera, the people who bring you uh, your Instacart orders. Um, everything that I can think of um, uh, works against the African-American community. And this is why it is so critically important um, that this community and the Latinx community and other communities of color definitely be the focus of vaccination efforts. Thank you so much. That's so, so critical, and, and, I, and I agree with you 100%. Um, you know, there, was, there are a series of factors that have influenced this. I know there's some new studies showing that it's definitely linked to uh, 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 insurance status. Um, and, and I think that there's a really interesting question here uh, that I myself haven't thought about, which is because we see that there is a, you know, there, there's a higher rates among black and brown people that they're considered somewhat vulnerable Right, so why aren't they being raised up, right, in terms of the priority list for vaccination? And and you know, because someone decided how to create the tiers, right? And if you have these populations, what that are seem to be more vulnerable based on all the data that we we've seen, why aren't they being pushed up the list of uh, on the vaccine priority list? Well, clearly, the most um, vulnerable populations are are two that have gotten the highest uh, priority. Um, healthcare workers, such as the uh, you know the nurses, the custodians at hospitals like uh, Martin Luther King Community Hospital. I mean, these, these are frontline heroes um, that are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat against COVID-19. Uh, they they are the highest priority of individuals to be vaccinated. Um, next would be um, individuals in in congregate living environments that we know have been just hammered with COVID-19, and not just um, you know long-term care facilities, but think about um, prison populations highly, highly impacted by COVID-19. And then you come to, to other populations. And I know that our policymakers are, are, are working as we speak to try to get vaccines to the populations most at risk, such as our communities of color. Thank you so much. And again, as we're running out of time, I you just wanted to, you know, you know as we think about current events, um, we, we keep hearing about new variants that are popping up. 
uh, globally and they're making their way, uh, you know, in, into the U.S. And so how worried should we be about those? Uh, and what do we know now about, you know, the impact of the various vaccines in terms of um, uh, uh, fighting off the, 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 the variants? So Dr. Deng, uh, can you give us an update on the variants and where we are with understanding the impact of vaccines on the, on the different variants? Yeah, so we have very limited information about that. I mean, it's just, it's still new. And in the context of the, when the trials were completed, Pfizer and Moderna had already concluded before the variants were discovered. So we don't know a lot about how it affects the vaccine efficacy. Uh, now that we know it exists, the companies are starting to do some of those smaller scale trials to get some information. And based on those smaller scale trials, there does appear to still still be some level of protection. And just scientifically from what we know, as long as the composition of the spike protein, which is the target, hasn't changed significantly, which from my understanding, the variants, it hasn't changed significantly, the vaccine will still be able to offer some level of protection. That's, that's great. And I think, we'll, like you said, we'll learn over time what the, the, the uh, efficacy rates will be, right, uh, for, for these new variants. And, uh, you know, they're, they're so new that we're just really uh, getting our hands around uh, it, much less understanding um, the efficacy of the, of the different vaccines against these variants. And so, you know, it being 515, I think we may want to, you know, close out and and adjourn. There's a ton of information in the chat. Um, and this is also being recorded. The, the, the town hall will be, uh, the recording will be posted on the, uh, the CTSI website. Um, there's also a, a frequently asked questions uh, a link on the CTSI website. So please take advantage of that. Um, also uh, write to the, the, the university to continue to put on these, um, these community outreach events and these town halls because they're so important for us to interact and interface with the community, to hear your perspective, uh, to get answers from, from the experts who themselves are community advocates. And so I can't thank you all enough uh, for, for attending. We had a full house, um, uh, roughly 200 people uh, attending. So, so this was a smashing success. Uh, again, I would like to thank the organizers um, and, uh, and definitely thank our speakers for uh, taking the time out to help educate our community on this really, really important issue uh, that we're facing. Uh, Meg, I don't know if uh, there are any additional closing comments. No, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Carbson, Dr. Carlisle, Dr. Ritchie, Dr. Dang. We really appreciate it. Okay, with that, have a good evening. God bless.